all that he does for our youth as well as uh, the City of Children and the Montgomery Mission trip. So make sure you tell Brandon thank you for all that when you see him today. He also has Children's Church, so any of our little ones that want to head back, you can do that at this time. You see them all running out, Mike? I do, I see them all. Yeah, they're just skittering past us. Yeah. Okay, you ready? Great vision. <laughs> Dear Father God, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to be here to learn, Lord, about your Savior, Jesus. Looking forward to this, Lord. Been waiting a long time to this part of the story. I pray that you speak through Gary. I pray that we learn. I pray that we're amazed of all the things our Savior does for us each and every day, Lord. We thank you for Gary, and we thank you for this word that's about to be preached. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Glad that you're here. Glad you've come to worship God with us. Uh, last week, I ended uh, my lesson with a story. Um, before I tell that, though, we've got Children's Church Homecoming. Remember Homecoming coming up in October. And we need you to be a part of that, all of our, guests, or all of our members. So our guests, please come back for our homecoming. Another trip to Florida, that's not bad. It's in October, and uh, we'd love to have you. But to our members, we need your help um, getting and tr trying to get all of our former members here, letting them know, reminding them, calling them, whatever it is. Okay? I'm excited about the homecoming, and uh, I think Rob's excited. There's two of us that are excited about the homecoming, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of excitement right now from, from, from our members. But a uh, great time coming up. We're looking forward to that weekend. Last week, I ended with a story of my boat sinking, okay, on the Saturday beforehand. And it's a new boat, and the good news is, the good news is, it was a manufacturer's defect. Boat didn't totally sink. We got towed in. Sea tow came and got us. And we are grateful for insurance to pay that $3,700 bill to get towed home. But it is a sinking feeling when your boat is sinking. <laughs> I just thought of that. But, but it, was, uh, it was sad. And so anyway, I am happy today that that's been taken care of. So on the way this morning to worship, we get here and uh, I get out of our car and close the door and I smell antifreeze. I said, what, where's that coming from? I checked in the car and the temperature gauge was pegged out. And then I look and I have antifreeze coming out of my car. I've not had two of the best weekends ever in my life, back to back. But uh, you know what? God is still good. And I was thinking about this and I was, what I was grateful for. I was grateful that Rhonda's such an encourager. I was grateful that with, with, with our boat, that everything's taken care of, the insurance paid, all that. I was grateful we got back safely. I was grateful we made it here today. We weren't on the uh, Mid-Bay Bridge. Uh, I'm grateful for all of that. And I'll be really grateful if I didn't run it so long without antifreeze that the engine isn't locked up. But hey, you know what? No matter what, God is good. And all the time. See, I don't have it like Todd has when he says that, but I will get there one day. But God is still good, and I am grateful for a loving Savior, still taking care of myself and my family through whatever things come along. So you're saying, Gary, what does this have to do with your lesson today? Well, let me, let me get to that. Uh, to our guests, we are studying uh, from this book, the story, that uh, is the Bible, it's the Bible. It, 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 it tells the Bible in one long story. And last week we started in the New Testament, and we're continuing that this week uh, in the New Testament. Jesus' birth was last week in the chapter we're in, chapter 23 this week, which is the ministry of Jesus, the ministry. And, you know, I read the chapter in the book. I read the Bible, and I go through that, and I've read it before and you see the ministry of Jesus. And we just have a sampling of the Lord's ministry. We don't have it all. I, I'm sure we don't have it all. 
And just the stories and, and all that we do have, I mean, the ministry of Jesus was, was absolutely amazing. And sometimes it's referred to as when, and we're going to look at Jesus' baptism, but when, when, when the baptism came as being the beginning of his ministry, actually probably a better way of putting that is maybe his public ministry and maybe not that that one could that term might not be that good because I don't see Jesus just beginning ministry upon his baptism I see Jesus in my mind of always ministering taking care of people throughout his life so maybe his baptism yeah we some people look at that uh, as his, at the beginning, as the beginning of his public ministry, but I, I think he was doing ministry even before then. And notice how I said he was doing ministry, doing, doing ministry. Ministry is oftentimes doing and taking care of one another. So, as we were last week after the birth of Jesus and all the events surrounding uh, that event, uh, we find him next in the temple as a twelve-year-old. Uh, a source of amazement who, 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 for those who were with him. We don't read anything about what he was doing until we get to this point in the story, the beginning of his ministry. And Jesus came into public ministry. People were amazed. They were saying, they were saying things like, wow, that, that's amazing. How can, he, how can he know that? How can he do that? What is going on? Jesus was absolutely amazing people with his abilities. So today, as we dive into chapter 23 of the, the story, the book, The Story, I want us to look at some observations concerning the ministry of Jesus. And first, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. And Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now, it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Yeah, an exciting time. The baptism of Jesus, and as I said earlier, is often noted as the beginning of his, of his public ministry. Before he, he, he comes to be baptized, John the Baptist is preaching to large crowds. People, you know, he had gone before Jesus. People are intrigued by him and what he has to say. The religious leaders were there. John was... was was, was going, going at the religious leaders, and then, and then Jesus shows up. John doesn't want to baptize Jesus because he feels unworthy, but he tells him, you know, you got to do this because all, all righteousness needs to be fulfilled. You see there, when he was baptized, and he came up out of the water, and the skies ripped open, and in verses 16 and 17 there, it tells us, tells us at that moment heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, It's my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Baptism. Baptism. Notice here, we see God the Son being baptized. We, we see in this God, the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove. And we see God, the Father, speaking from heaven. What a magnificent thing that was in the baptism of Jesus. Hmm. People ask, well, you know, why did he do that? I mean, wasn't he sinless? Well, of course he was. To fulfill all righteousness. John's baptism was not a part of the uh, Old Testament system. We see here in the New Testament that, that it is a part of God's will, a command given by God through the prophet in John 
chapter 1, verse 33, And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was saying, you know, he was doing this because it was what God wanted him to do. Even though this was not stated as a reason in the Bible, like I said, many mark it as the beginning of his ministry or his public ministry. I think Jesus was doing ministry regardless of this. Another observation that, 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 that I see here concerns Jesus' ministry. We see after his baptism, the devil tried to derail Jesus' ministry even before it really got off the ground. After the baptism, Jesus, Mark says in Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 12, that at once Jesus was compelled by the Spirit to go into the desert. Have you ever noticed that many times spiritual highs, spiritual victories are sometimes followed up by temptations? You're, you're up on this mountaintop, you're feeling good, you got the devil whooped, or so it seems, then you hit that valley. The devil, Satan, is not a myth. Very real being who wants to divide us from God. The devil is all about, about division. We see Matthew chapter 4 opens up in one, uh, verses 1 through 3. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You know, verse 3 is interesting there. The, the writer of this, Matthew, says after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Did Matthew really have to tell us that he was hungry? I mean, is that not like a Captain Obvious thing there? I, you've heard me tell stories of going through Air Force survival school. I was only without food for like seven days. And we came out of the woods in East Washington State. Was I hungry? Yeah, pretty hungry. Pretty hungry. Some of you might have been through Air Force survival school or other things like that. You get pretty hungry. Forty days, forty nights? Yeah, he was hungry. I can see the real temptation here. The devil thought he had found a weakness and, and, and he was going in for the kill. If you ever notice, when, when does Satan attack? He, you know, it, it's, it's at those times of weakness. After an argument with, with your spouse or with somebody else or after six months of sobriety, when, when a crisis comes and you've got to decide whether to go back the old ways or stay on the right path, hits us when we're weak. Here's Jesus. He's hungry. The devil comes in and basically says, you know, if you're a son of God, you turn these stones to bread. That seems actually pretty harmless, doesn't it? I mean, he's hungry. He can do what he wants. He's God. He could make those stones into bread, I'm sure. Pretty simple there. Hmm. Makes you wonder, and as you know, as the story goes, he didn't do that. But I think it kind of begs the question, why did Jesus need to be tempted? Why, why was this need? I mean, we see there in Matthew 4, verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was led by the Spirit. Jesus, why? I mean, this was, this was set up. Jesus led by the Spirit. He didn't just wander out there. It, it came pretty close. I, I think uh, the, the, the King James even mentions immediately or right away uh, that, that he was led out to the desert or to the wilderness. And it says to be tempted by the devil. What? Why? Why? Why, why would this happen? And, and I think it's because he could show that temptation can be overcome. 
and that Jesus can relate to our struggle. Matthew chapter 4, continuing there, verses 15 and 16. Hebrews, not Matthew. I was wondering, what is wrong with my slide here? Hebrews, not Matthew. Hebrews 4, 15, 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Another, another reason here was so that he could personally defeat the devil's schemes. He could personally do it and, 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 and show us an example for us to follow. Jesus was tempted. Jesus was human. Jesus, Jesus had to fight off these temptations. And, and, you know, did he do it by trying to argue law or logic with the devil? No, no, he didn't do that. He used scriptures in each of his three temptations. He used scriptures as a, as, as, as a defense against them. Why, why the devil even used the scripture out of context to try to convince Jesus to, to, to come over to his demands. The devil is using scripture. Church, we can defeat the devil himself. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. I don't know about you. Most of us know this verse by heart. We've seen it a, a, a bunch of times. That's a difficult verse for me. It's difficult because as I read it, I say, you know, wow. He is not going to let me be tempted beyond what I can bear. He'll give me a way out. But I think I need to focus in on this verse and to remember this verse that no matter what temptation might come along, God is still there. And if God has provided a way out, maybe I need to find that way out. Maybe I need to look for that way, that way out, knowing that God will provide it and give me a way out of whatever temptation might come along. You see, the devil is alive and he's well and, and, and we can defeat him. We can defeat him when he comes to try to feed on us. The devil tried to take Jesus out by, by giving his best punch. And Jesus didn't blink. He won. So since he was not successful in defeating Jesus on his own, he decided to recruit some people to help him. Pharisees and Sadducees, well, these were the, well, these were the church folk. They were more than willing to help the devil derail his ministry because they were a little jealous of Jesus. They were jealous of his wisdom, of his understanding. He was popular. Why, he even performed miracles. They didn't like all of this. Now, not all of them were out to get Jesus. Some like Nicodemus that we see in John chapter 3 we're, 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 we're earnestly seeking the truth. We see in Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, Jesus, he's with some of these leaders. Remember now, he keeps going to the synagogue to teach. They probably didn't like to see him coming up the walkway. Here comes Jesus again. He's popular. Everybody loves him. He's healing folks. He's doing these miracles. We can't do any of that. How do we get rid of this guy? So on this day, on this Sabbath, there's a man with a withered hand. 
And Jesus, he's going to heal him. And, and you, you know what? You would think that this would be a time to rejoice. I mean, we rejoice when people are healed. And here it was going to be a miracle. I, I was, the guy had a withered hand, and I'm assuming he was going to be healed right there. The hand was going to be okay. Time to rejoice, time to be happy. But these guys, no, not at all. No. Let's actually look at this narrative right here. Luke 6, 6 through 11. On another Sabbath, he went to the synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was shriveled. Pharisees, the teachers of the law, were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They watched him closely, see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. He said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. He got up and stood there. Jesus said to him, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, do good or do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so and his hand was completely restored. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. I mean, get the irony here. These people are upset. They were, it says they were furious. This man now has a whole hand. It is no longer shriveled or withered or whatever was wrong with it. And they don't like it because you did this on the Sabbath. A little bit of legalism, you reckon? Good Alabama English there. You reckon? A little bit of legalism. And their legalism, watch this, their legalism opened them up to be used by Satan against Jesus. We need to guard ourselves against schemes of the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Yeah, Jesus was attacked by the devil. And I hate to tell you this, church, but you will too. You will be attacked as well. Jesus defeated the devil. We can also. Our text this morning, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What a great verse that is. Church, let me tell you, God's been pursuing us since the fall. Jesus went through all the trials and temptations because he, he loves us all. He loves us all. No matter what, He loves us all. So, we're going to finish this up this morning. Let me tell you, life won't always be easy. Life won't always be good. There will be death and there will be destruction. There will be boats sinking and there will be cars having antifreeze coming out of them in front of everyone on a Sunday morning. God is still good, and God still provides. And you know what? God still took care of me through a boat sinking and a car leaking antifreeze. I'm kind of afraid of next weekend, to be honest with you. So y'all pray for me next weekend. Nevertheless, no matter what our trials, no matter what's going on, and, and, and there are times, and you know what, those, let me tell you about a boat sinking. That's such a frivolous thing. After I talked about that last week, I thought about, you know what, there are people that have diseases and cancers and other things that wish their issue was a boat sinking. There are people that don't have a car and have to walk or don't have much in life or don't know where their next meal is coming from. And I'm whining about my car. Frivolous. Crazy. I mean, God still took care of me. God still provided for me. Why would I be upset over something like that? 
What if I have to get a new engine? Oh, well. That'll be the fourth new engine for that car. (laughs) God is still so good to us. He sent his son to be an example. And he sent his son to be baptized. He sent his son to die and to be resurrected. Because he loves us, every single one of us. Church, today, I mean, we, we saw the ministry of Jesus, and I encourage you in your ministry as well, whatever that might be. And I tell you, all of us, we have different ministries. We're not all the same. I encourage us to be like Christ as much as we can. I, I tell you, for me, it's easier for me to try to be like a, a Paul or a Peter or a David than like Jesus, who was sinless. It's like, I... I, I I can't fathom a, a, a man living and never sinning. But I can picture myself like Peter, and Paul, David, others. But church, that's where salvation comes in. That's where grace comes in. And today, you know what? If you are not a Christian, you can become one today. You can be baptized today. Jesus was baptized. There's no reason for him to be baptized other than to fulfill all righteousness because he was sinless. We're not sinless. You want to wash those sins away? Do you still want to? You're still going to be an imperfect person and you will still sin. But there's grace. There's grace. There's mercy and there's love. And we can get that for you today. If you need to come back to the Lord, you can do that. If you don't want to come down this aisle, that's okay too. You get with me afterwards. You get with the elders afterwards. If you need to be baptized, if you need something else, and to our guest here today, you have our bulletin. And in the back of the bulletin are our phone numbers. You're welcome to call me or text me as well as elders or others. If you're down here and you need something while you're down here, call on us. We're here to help you. We're here to minister to you, whatever, however that might be. So, with that, we're going to have an invitation song. If you are here today, subject to the invitation, and want to respond, you're welcome to do that. You're welcome to get with me later, as I said. But um, whatever your needs are, we'd love for them to be met today. Let's all stand and sing.